We are, we are in for a treat, which is a, another keynote address. And as you can see, um, we are inexorably getting drawn closer to the future. To set the stage for the post-96 act boom and bust, we have somebody who initially with Jim Crow, but then on his own, uh, lived it. And he's been a great friend to us here in Silicon Flatirons, uh, Dan Cruz. So we heard how the story began. Now we're going to look at the next big chapter of the story. This is a headline article from the New York Times in, in 2002. So it's well after the boom and into the meltdown. The fiber optic fantasy slips away. So I want people in the room, especially people who are new to industry, to understand the gravity of what happened uh, from the stream of building these fiber networks. And the way the New York Times put it at the time is rarely have so many people with so much money have gotten it so wrong. I mean, this was a big deal. So instead of finding customers to fill up all this fiber, uh, they found that we found ourselves with just way too much fiber and not sure what to do with it. A lot of people are familiar with the Enron story. Enron was happening parallel, and Enron did have ties into Telcom. But here's another article from the New York Times, published just a couple months after that first one. It started with a reference to Enron, about this company driven by greedy executives, accounting scandals, accountants doing things accountants shouldn't be doing. But what they said is, because of Enron, something was hidden right in plain sight. And that was a whole industry was going through what Enron went through. Uh, identical plot, same kind of sub-stories, uh, and monumentally more tragic outcomes when you add it all up. And that was the telecom industry, the very industry that the last panel talked about creating. Two trillion dollars of value eroding because of the meltdown that ensued. Mountains of debt, little revenue, kind of starting all over again. So now let's look backwards a little. So that's kind of the end of at least that chapter of the story. What happened? Where did that really come from? And Warren Buffett, who I know Jim Crow has a lot of respect for, as do I, Warren Buffett was kind of the one person through this all who kind of watched it play out and got a lot of criticism at the time. A lot of people called him over the hill, past his prime, didn't see this whole trend coming. But it's interesting to look back now on what Warren Buffett said after the fact. First thing he said is, like most trends, at the beginning it's driven by fundamentals. So something was making this disaster happen. And you know what? We were right. The Internet did change everything. We all know that today. And we're also right that the bandwidth appetite that would result from that was incredible. This first bar here is the amount of bandwidth that was needed during the big telecom boom. It doesn't even show up on this chart. Now let's look at it during the meltdown. So during the quote unquote meltdown, bandwidth grew dramatically. So the problem wasn't bandwidth growth. In fact, if you look at after the meltdown, through the period of time we are today, it continued to grow. And if you focus on mobile networks, it grows even more. 100% a year right now is what Cisco estimates the recent growth to be. So the problem wasn't the need for bandwidth. The problem wasn't that the internet was overrated. And also the problem wasn't the importance of fiber to all. Fiber is, and for as long as I can see, will be the workhorse of the internet. And then there's one more thing we believed at the time, and that is owners of these fiber networks would prosper. So I got a little <laughs> quote here. On the left is the judge saying, well, what's the verdict? Were we right about that one too? And the bailiff says, Give us a little bit more time. The jury's still on deliberations on this one. So are the owners of fiber going to prosper? I think so. But that one verdict's out a little bit. So Buffett goes on to say, initially, when you have one of these cycles, it's the wise men, or use the word man, the wise person, who uh, moves in the beginning. And there were a lot of wise people around this one, real wise people. Billionaire types. Let's look at a few. Craig McCall, you heard the name earlier. Pioneer of wireless. He started Nextlink, which looks like Nick's belt here. Sold it to XO Communications. Built fiber networks throughout a lot of tier two, tier three cities. 
He saw this early on, put a lot of his own money behind it. Uh, another example, John Kluge, billionaire media model, both the newspaper and media era. Uh, he actually was a initial money behind his company, MFN, um, Metropolitan Fiber Networks, which then became above that, which now I'm proud to say is part of Zale. He saw it coming, made a lot of money. Another guy, Walter Scott, you know, someone Jim knows extraordinarily well, uh, from a billionaire from uh, construction world, funded MFS Communications, funded Level 3, saw it coming. We had another example locally here, Phil Anschutz. You know, built, funded this company after making already billions of dollars, funded this company called SP Telecom, that then changed its name to Quest. Quest then buys US West. You know, saw it coming and made a whole bunch of money. So Buffett goes on to liken this to Cinderella's ball. When Cinderella got all ready for the ball and went there, it was wonderful. She got dressed up, everyone else was dressed up, they drank, they danced, they had a great time. Well, this was a ball too, and boy, what a ball was it. I mean, it was beyond anything I think most people in the room who weren't part of it could possibly imagine. You got your, you got your picture and name on the cover of Business Week calling yourself the telecom cowboy, and talking about you're the best executive in the United States. A little closer to home, Jim Crow, the past speaker, uh, on the cover of the money section of USA Today with the likes of Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Walter Scott, the idea behind Level 3 uh, to build a global fiber optic communication network. A dream team with a dream network and a killer business plan, so long as we didn't screw it up. Then you had some more fun stories. This guy, Gary Winnick, who I don't know if you remember this, uh, Jim, if you're still here, but uh, Jim and I actually had lunch with him not too far from here. I remember having a cheeseburger trying to figure out who this guy was. Uh, he uh, sold $734 million from this global crossing, now owned by Level 3, uh, and he was flamboyant about it all. He bought a $92 million estate in Bel Air. He uh, spent hundreds of thousand dollars building up his offices. He gave Rolls Royce to one of his executives, and he even uh, decided that they needed a fleet of five planes to travel around the world. You know, this is a company that never made money. Gets better. ICG, a company I took over with John Siegel uh, as one of my investors, uh, the guy who originally started that was this guy, Shelby Bryant, called by the New York Observer, tall, smooth, charming, seductive even. This is a telecom guy, right? <laughs> the Vogue editor leaves her husband to get together with the President Clinton at the time, schmoozed Democrats in this guy's uh, apartment. These were pretty heady days. John Malone, a local billionaire who's one of the smartest business guys around, somehow got convinced to give him $500 million to support this ICG Communications a company we bought for $8.7 million years later. Actually, not too many years later. Enron, we think of Enron as energy, but Enron had a big telecom <coughs> division as well, a broadband trading concept that went completely bust. Some of their stories, 1.5 million at a Christmas party. Elephants making appearances for, uh, for employee meetings. Renting out an amusement park. And closer to home, having all their executives come out here to Beaver Creek and stay in one of the nicest hotels that you can pay for. Kalzowski from Tyco had a $2 million birthday toga bash for his wife in Italy and a $6,000 shower curtain that made quite a bit of fame as this thing all unraveled. So now Buffett goes on to liken this further to Cinderella and says, uh, you know, Cinderella knew it was going to end. She knew her carriage was going to turn into pumpkins and mice. And uh, like, likewise, uh, you know, the equity markets who funded this uh, kind of sooner or later are going to have to see the same type of outcome. But there's a difference because Cinderella knew something. Cinderella knew that her ball was going to end at midnight. She knew she had to get out of there right before the ball ended. She wasn't very good at getting completely out of there by the time it ended, but she at least knew when it was. That's not how it works with a big, big bust, a big... Uh, big boom bus cycle. You don't know when the clock starts. Everyone's trying to wait to the last minute because in those closing minutes is when the ball becomes most fun. That's when valuations jump the highest. And you think, boy, if I just get out at the right time, 
you know, I'll make all the money. But you don't have a clock. You don't know what time it ends. You don't know what even time it is. So if you're lucky enough to get out, like some of the people I mentioned in the middle part of the section, you did quite fine. If you stuck around, it all evaporated. So I'm going to give you the rest of Buffett's quote that I started earlier. What the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. Let's look at some of those stories. ICG, CEO quits, two directors quit, and the shares fell. First, when we saw this, we thought it was a typo. Fell from 78 cents to 88 cents. Well, how did it get to buck 70? Because it was probably 100 bucks at some point. Uh, just falls to the floor. Let's look at that in a chart format for Enron. Uh, Stock price way up there, 90 bucks a share to nothing in a pretty short period of time. I think this is uh, by month, so you're looking at about a year period of time going from a big high to low. And unlike the current, the most recent housing crisis, a lot of people went to jail on this one. A couple examples here, uh, Ken Lay avoided jail only, uh, only because he passed away, you know, probably right before he would have uh, got convicted. His uh, partner, uh, Skilling, uh, did go to jail, and I think he's still there today. 24 years. In fact, the guy who spoke here not too long ago in this room, after just getting done with his, uh, his sentence, uh, the CFO of Enron, uh, he did six years. WorldCom, largest bankruptcy ever. I, it may have been a large one since then, but at the time, largest bankruptcy ever. People we worked with. These are people I knew. It's people we were close to. I was on Bernie Ebers' boat. I knew Scott Sullivan fairly well. Uh, Bernie, who was on the cover of Newsweek as a tel of Business Week as a tel count cowboy, is now going to be in jail pretty much for the rest of his life. And Scott Sullivan, who was a good guy but in way over his head and got creeped into some bad territory, is still in jail to this day. Arthur Anderson was the premier accounting firm. Uh, we talked about Sarbanes-Oxley today and all the over-regulation of public companies. This is where it came from. It came from the, the big tel count bus and the dot-com bus and maybe more specifically, from Arthur Anderson's role in it. So Arthur Anderson went from the premier accounting firm to gone, to being done with, in part because of Enron and WorldCom and, and other stuff as well. Kozlowski, the guy of the $2 million birthday bash in Italy and $6,000 shower curtain, in jail along with his CFO. Carl Icahn, I don't know where they got this picture for Carl Icahn, <laughs> but he uh, ended up sweeping in to buy up this XO for almost nothing, and uh, you know, pretty traumatic on the employees. I think Carl's going to do quite well on the transaction. So, so what? You know, that happened a long time ago, five, even ten years ago now, depending on how you count, and now what? We're going to talk about that a little bit in the panel. Uh, to me, there's a uh, Lots of lessons learned, but I really boil it down to four. Uh, the first one is being right. Okay, and This is where Buffett, in this particular case, you should really pay attention to him. Uh, being right is, isn't always being doing what is most popular at the time. Being right is something that you've got to know from within. Uh, if you're right and you stick with it, you'll probably be fine. If you get caught up in a hype, starting to chase something that you really don't believe in, the story can end very badly for you. So really keep thinking about, is there really a business here? Is there really the, the, a foundation that I'm willing to spend my life, my reputation, my character on? Second is management ethics. Management ethics matter a lot. A lot of where these companies went wrong is they knew they were doing wrong. They knew they were bending the rules at first. And they knew that they went beyond bending the rules and uh, were way over any rational limit. But they thought they'd get away with it. They didn't want to be left behind. They saw people they knew make a bunch of money, and they wanted to make it too. Management ethics matter. Third is business philosophy. And, and again, I point to Warren Buffett. He, he does a great job, for those of you who don't follow him, of sharing with us his wisdom. He shares it openly, honestly, and uh, you can learn a lot from it. And a lot of it starts with, what's your business philosophy? You know, what do you really believe in? And you have to develop that and you have to stick with it. I won't go into any of the specifics now, but a lot of these companies got way off track because they weren't really rooted in a strong philosophy about what it really means to build and run a business for the long term. And then lastly, execution competency. A lot of the people who 
we're in this, particularly after the initial investments and more during the, you know, the, the right before the pre-bus cycle, they weren't executing a business plan. They weren't focused on really running a business for the long term. They were just trying to create a set of hype so that they could inflate the value of their company and then pull the parachute and move on. Execution matters. You know, how well do you really run your business? So those are, in a, you know, quick summary, the takeaways that I could probably talk on for hours. But I will close and turn over to panel after making a little bit of pitch for first the front range here. Uh, what's amazing is when you look at all that competitive fiber that was built, the, the billions and billions and billions of dollars of competitive fiber, most of it belongs in the hands of Level 3, TW Telcom, and Zale. And then topped off a little bit about Quest, which is now owned by CenturyLink. So right here in the front range, right here in the front range, is really the heart of what is the competitive fiber industry. And I don't think we really know it as an industry, as a, as a community. And secondly, and, and Jim kind of referenced this, we're at the beginning of a long cycle. Like all that's happened, boom, bust, and what preceded that, that's the beginning of a, of a multi-generation cycle where bandwidth has become more and more and more important, and the technology and infrastructure that allows it is going to be the home of great jobs for years and years to come. So bandwidth and bandwidth infrastructure and internet infrastructure in general is a great place for fulfilling careers. So those students in the room, as you're looking what you want to do afterwards, you know, don't view this as an industry that had its heyday and now is, uh, is kind of in its maturing cycle. It's just beginning. Remember that bandwidth curve I showed earlier? That's not going to end. So with that, uh, hopefully I teed up a very interesting panel discussion. I'll turn over to Phil. All right. <laughs> We have a great next group of panelists, uh, an, a premier analyst, a premier investor, a couple premier people from practice, and a lot of historical knowledge and insights. So I won't give you all their introductions. I do want to. I do want to start with a question for Craig, which it was good to see the faces, Dan, of all those um, people who uh, developed these fraudulent schemes and were really in it, not with the, like you said, business philosophy to build a business, but to make a quick buck. Um, Craig, when you look back at this period of where things started becoming high flyers um, and some of the companies that were really, unfortunately, the poster children for that. Um, when did you start to think this was getting a little out of control or off the rails, and it was going to kind of, at some point, explode? Um, well, so first, I was not in the capital markets at the time. I was actually advising companies at the time. I was leading the telecom practice at, uh, at Boston Consulting Group. And um, as it happened, I was doing a project for Bernie Evers. Um, I, he had never been a client, and as you can imagine, in a consulting firm in the telecom practice, you're watching WorldCom uh, stock go up every day. And so we said, look, we've got to, you know, he, he, these guys are, 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 are onto something. Let's figure out what they're doing. I mean, let's see if we can get some business from them, right? Um, and I finally got an opportunity to do some work for, for Bernie, and actually, with, you know, some of you in the room will remember Ron Beaumont, who was running his. Uh, his wholesale operation and uh, and John Sigmore, the late John Sigmore, who had coined the phrase at the time that internet demand is doubling um, every six months, which is not actually what he said and not what he meant, um, but it became sort of attributed to him. And so I was, you know, we had been asked um, to figure out whether or sort of how how this picture fits together and how WorldCom's um, competitiveness really stacks up against the next generation networks that were being built like level three. Um, and we did the work inside and um, and I, I remember standing at a whiteboard with Bernie um, and and particularly with Ron and, and John and saying, look, we got a problem here because you you have the number of networks since 1984, say start with a unit of one at divestiture just for simplicity's sake, the number of networks had grown by ninefold at that time. There were nine networks. The number of strands per network had grown by something like nine strands per network. 
you had gone from DS zeros to DS threes to OC three to OC twelve to OC forty eight to and uh, and then wave division multiplexing. You added it up all, all together. And we started doing it on the whiteboard and saying, okay, so you've got nine times nine times six times six times six times six times six times six times six, and then you've got dense wave division multiplexing times two times two times two. And we got to about th that you would increase the capacity in the center of the network 181 million fold. Um, and that you simply, there was no conceivable way you weren't going to have a, a complete collapse of the industry. Um, and now, it, it, some years later, and, and I actually published um, a document at the time that said, look, we're coming to the biggest collapse. And what that, year is that? You published? This was 1998, saying that you know, we're, we're headed toward the biggest calamity maybe that we've ever seen in any industry. Um, Fast forward a couple of years, and when I, when I got to Wall Street in 2002, one of the things that I was really um, disheartened by, because I remember thinking at the time, you know, gee, if I'd been on Wall Street, think about how much money you could have made with the insight that this was going to blow up. Now, by the way, it, had you shorted the, the telecom stocks in 1998, you would have long since been bankrupt before you ever made money, and so not many people could have lasted long enough. So. You would have been so early that you, you would have been indistinguishable from being completely wrong. But the thing that was really surprising to me was when I got to Wall Street and started working with big investors, um, I don't think they were just saying this for revisionist history. They understood that they were investing into a bubble. They, the, the disheartening part was their incentives were such that they had no choice but to invest in the bubble. Because if you were running a growth fund, and you knew this is absolutely unsustainable, this is crazy. On the other hand, if I don't invest and ride this market up, I'm not going to have my job in six months. Not in six years, but in six months. I simply have to hold my nose and do it. Um, and so the incentives in the capital markets were such that you had this perverse cycle of pouring investment into it and, uh, and you know, it really stimulate. I, I'll, I'll make a, a rather controversial claim, but I think the the bursting of the telecom bubble was so calamitous that um, it wasn't the bursting of the internet bubble, that was small in terms of market cap, um, that Alan Greenspan had to step in and inflate another bubble to avoid the recession that would have followed. Um, that stimulated the housing market and led to the collapse of the housing market and led to the great recession that we've had and, and we still aren't out of it and all of that is essentially the echo of 1999 in the housing bubble, uh, the telecom bubble. You made the statement about analysts buying these publicly traded stocks that, as Dan put it, had never made money, like high flyers, like uh, Global Crossing. It, it reminds me of the statement, I believe it was the CEO of Citigroup who said, you've got to, was it Charles Prince, you've got to keep dancing until the music stops? That's exactly right, sure. yes. Um, now, John, you're uh, coming from a more venture capital perspective, uh, not a publicly traded equities. When you were in this mm -hmm. space looking at this, did you get to a point, circa 98, 99, 2000, say, wait a minute, something really wrong is going on here. This claim about huge, hugely increasing demand and how much supplies out there doesn't match. Well, it's, it's funny. I think anyone who has been in this industry for, say, 20, 15, 20 years, you're going to have that aha moment, and hopefully it's not when you pick up the newspaper and you saw WorldCom was going down. And uh, I, at that, it, it, in the late 90s, I was working for Morgan Stanley's private equity group, and we actually were the third largest private equity investor in the world, and they, we had a very large telecom practice. Um, we backed a group called Equant. It was basically spun out of the airline reservation business. Um, Royce Holland, uh, who Dan, uh, Dan and Jim Crow know, we were the backers, one of the original backers of, of Allegiance, and I kind of cut my teeth in that era of you know, kind of the post read hunt uh, the regulation. And I remember being in a meeting, I had this just kind of like, oh my God, this is, this whole thing is gonna end right now. Um, meeting in London, where I was sitting in a room and we had Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, KKR, and Welsh Carson. And there were 20 people, there were probably 25 people in the room, there were probably 10 bankers. And we were discussing a company called FirstMark. 
And Firstmark was a fixed wireless broadband company. And the, it was backed by, you know, the board of directors were Henry Kissinger and Vernon Jordan and um, uh, the guy who was CEO of the company had been a former Morgan Stanley banker. And I, I was, I think I was 30 years old at this time. I remember sitting around looking in this room and every investor was talking about writing a quarter billion dollar check into this business that had awful spectrum. If you look back on an awful spectrum, not matched up across a bunch of geographies. The business plan was to be the intelligent of Europe, intelligent, which went down in a ball of flame, you know, probably <laughs> nine months later and took, took, you know, probably $4 billion of market cap with it. And I remember sitting in this room looking around and thinking, oh my God, I know more about this business than anyone else in this room, including the CEO. It's time to get out now. And I went, I went two weeks later and resigned from Morgan Stanley and that's when I went to Columbia. So, and what year is that? That was, that was the end of 99 into 2000. So <clears throat> it's interesting how this is visible from different angles. Um, those in the policy world, um, a friend of mine who's in that world said he had gone to a party that was held for uh, Congressman Markey circa 1999. And the way some of these companies were throwing money around, getting back to Dan's nice imagery, led him to think a little bit like the Great Depression with you know, uh, people who are shining shoes giving stock tips. This is way out of control. Um, Paul, you were kind of from that world. When and how did you get any insight that this was uh, going to go off the rails? Well, I, later than everybody else, because it's Washington. It's, uh, in, in fact, I think you can see um, uh, evidence that after these two incidents, most of the people in Washington were still basing policy on the assumption that it would go on and increase indefinitely. But I, I think at that time, uh, I, I remember, so in um, late 90s, I was working for Senator Rockefeller and didn't start at the FCC until 2001, so right in that era, um, there was definitely a feeling that th this was uh, going to continue. People were talking about Enron getting into the telecom business and that this was going to accelerate things even farther. Bandwidth trading was going to be the new um, uh, big business uh, for them. And, and then I, I think you can see at the FCC, even in as late as um, in, in the 1999 uh, 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 time frame, you see the FCC making its decision on how to uh, study uh, competition in the special access market, squarely with the uh, with the thought that we're never going to really have to do this. So what do they do? They say we're going to determine which areas have competition and which areas don't have competition in special access, not by actually looking at competition in special access, not by looking at fundamentals, but instead by looking at whether there's co-location equipment in a particular number of central offices. And even at the time, everyone knew this was kind of a dodgy way of doing it, but I think the thought was it doesn't really matter because there's going to be so much competition going on for so long that let's just choose a bright line rule that's easy to administer that won't tie up hundreds of FCC lawyers administering it but we don't have to worry about it because competition is going to continue. And that, that turned out to be uh, wrong. So, Colleen, you represent customers who are seeking to benefit from the competition. During this <coughs> heyday, 1999 is clearly, a, um, you know, with respect to Prince, you know, the time to party in this sector. <laughs> when, uh, when were customers really getting the best deals? Was, was that actually consonant or was it two separate worlds? The real world that customers had versus the uh, apparent world that was evident on Wall Street about all the hype and uh, rah rah. You know, this is when broadband took on a whole new meaning. Um, I represent enterprise customers who buy what everyone used to call special access, meaning broadband pipes into business buildings. And this is the time when broadband suddenly meant, meant residential video transmission services or, as the internet came into play, broadband internet access. And the concern that enterprise customers had who were participating in a lot of the FCC proceedings to deregulate the business broadband market, a.k.a. special access, our big concern was the FCC was betting on the con, as they say in Las Vegas. The FCC knew that competition had not arrived. There's a lot of fiber rings out there, but they don't do you any good if you can't get into a commercial building from the ring. That's the choke point. That's the bottleneck. That's what special access is. That's what the commission was regulating. And the commission said, 
we can tell that the competition cavalry are riding over the hill. Just look at the crest of the hill. You can see the horse's heads. It's going to be here. And so on the strength of that confidence and prediction, the commission deregulated what has become a bottleneck for the past 15 years. And now that I've you know, heard the perspective of people who were not like me with my head buried in the Washington sand, but um, dealing with the marketplace realities at the time, I have a little more sympathy for the decision makers in Washington who were swept along by this tide of optimism and um, you know, lots of money out there, lots of competition. It's, it's a, a, you know, they don't want to be King Canute. The tide of competition is coming and no one can hold it back. At the time, business users, the customers of Special Access, were telling the commission, it ain't here yet. And we're happy to have you deregulate once it's here. We are all companies who aren't great supporters of regulation. But until competition arrives, hold your fire. Don't turn this market loose. Don't bet on the come. And since then, the, what we've seen is, I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day because I was at the FCC during the time frame that the previous panel was addressing, writing the SDN and Megacom orders. Um, and what we've seen since the 1990 deregulatory initiative of the FCC was um, deregulation, everybody's complaining, uh, AT&T then not part of uh, a special access provider, but an independent standalone long distance company, goes to the courts, um, files a, a mandate, a mandamus petition to try and get the commission to do its job and regulate special access. Uh, and, and everyone in the you know, customer community is complaining about this, this pattern of the commission ignoring the realities of how these services were being priced. And they were being you know, priced in a way to exploit the monopoly. So I was thinking about all, all of this um, and getting ready for the panel. And I realized it had a familiar ring. So I found this article from 1988 in Network World. And it's an editorial complaining about the FCC foot dragging on its regulation of special access. And the editorial says, you know, this is an unwarranted delay. Um, the FCC hasn't fulfilled its role. Um, it hasn't taken action when it should. Users and others have been complaining to the commission. And users and others even went to the courts and filed a mandamus petition uh, in response to which the FCC said, we're working on it. We're going to get, we're going to change the rules, which is, Precisely what happened in 2009, 2010, we went to the courts and we filed a mandamus petition and the FCC said, we're working out, we're going to fix this. So I'm, I'm struck by the cyclical nature of this. I'm not sure, I hope that doesn't bode anything too badly for <laughs> the other people on this panel that this cycle seems to be repeating itself. But the notion that when a lot of money pours into a market and it may or may not be a bubble, but we're going to predict that that much money it just can't help but drag competition <clears throat> along with it. And therefore, we're going to base our policies and our regulation of a market that is still not competitive on that influx of, of capital strikes me as nuts. And it's uh, corporate customers who have paid the price for that in, in the past 10 years. They've paid way too much for a service that's you know the nervous system of their companies. So Tom, uh, just so people know what the best cases on the other side, you can react to it. There is a difficult judgment call that regulators have, which is if they do think competition is contestable, can come, there is a rationale to lifting regulation on the theory that it will accelerate the coming of competition. Um, as regulators have to figure out how to get reliable information about what's likely to happen, and, and the argument I don't think is a non, um, is, is not sort of serious, but the argument is, hey, listen, all these people in Wall Street think all this competition is happening. They're betting their money. That's a pretty good indicator that we should think it's coming, too. Looking back at the FCC and how they process information, you know, what, what's your Monday morning quarterback report on that? I think Chairman Kennard got the mechanism exactly right because it was highly administrable. And that is, they made a determination that when the Bell companies, and all they did in uh, 1999, when they adopted the special access deregulation, is they came up with trigger mechanisms that the Bell companies could show based upon investment, based upon fiber-based investment in a certain number of wire centers in a given MSA. The, the complaint 
as it relates to the special access rules goes to the fact that you could have competition in one area of an MSA and then the deregulation occurs throughout the MSA based upon some revenue trigger calculations that the FCC came up with. But I think Kennard got that exactly right in that he came up with a, an administrable that was understandable way towards deregulation. Um, you didn't ask this question, but I think fundamental to both of the uh, enormous problems that the country had with uh, the investment boom in telecom and then the subsequent investment boom in the, the, um, in the housing market was complexity, right? There was extraordinary complexity, and telecom is one of those industries, and particularly common carrier regulation, that is, um, it's just very, very hard to understand. I'm reminded of, you know, con uh, continuing with the Warren Buff Buffett theme that Dan laid out, of comments he made to Nehruk at a winter meeting down in Miami, where, you know, where he said, when I get a telecom proposal, I take that proposal and I put it in the basket on my desk that says, too hard to understand. <laughs> well, that doesn't strike me as an industry that you know, too many people are going to want to invest in. And I think in part that has to do with this regulatory regime that is, um, you know, some would say evolving, uh, depending upon political pressure, has um, at different points in time required the incumbent providers to share their network to a degree that is, you know, frankly, from my view, unreasonable. And when I was chief of the bureau, I probed the economists and I said, why is it that these unbundling rules are so unlimited? Why aren't they limited in quantity and time? Because as Chairman Powell said, ultimately if it's not you know, uh, facilities-based competition, it won't be meaningful competition. And I think Powell had it exactly right. And ultimately, as we've, we've come to learn, the most sustainable competition that, that we see in the market is an in intermodal facilities-based competition. It just so happens that the cable companies had the advantage of having the stickier part of the bundle, which was video. What, you know, one of the things that I think is important as we're having this conversation, today the FCC still regulates voice service throughout the vast majority of the country as a dominant service. I, I think that is hysterical. That, Wait, that, which, which, which products are the FCC regulating? Uh, the FCC regulates, you know, to this day, they regulate voice service. They just did the. No, but which which type of voice service? Because because the FCC, I mean, long distance is totally deregulated, and local is regulated at the state level. And mostly deregulated but, by many states. Well, at the end of the day, voice. At the, at the end of the day, if you go to the FCC and you are seeking uh, non-dominant carrier treatment, right? For example, <laughs> we've got a client in Puerto Rico that did, you know, exactly that. Do you have to show? You know, we can show half, half of the line loss in the past you know, 10 years has been you know, access line loss, 50% of line loss. Right. So the FCC still treats you know, for purposes of dominant carrier regulation. So for the, 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 well, that was my question. So the trigger is under the 96 Act, as long as you're the dominant incumbent, <clears throat> you have to provide certain facilities at, like you said, unbundled. And in order to get out of that, you've got to show you're not the dominant carrier. Quest has had this issue, I think, in Phoenix most recently, right, where they tried to say, hey, we shouldn't be treated as a dominant carrier, and the FCC denied it. Although in Omaha, they got some relief. You know, in Omaha, right. In Omaha back in, in 2006. But that, that, that's, that's another version of the same kind of conundrum for policymakers. How do you develop a theory of emerging competition, and what data points do you look at, and what competitors do you look at as serious? Dan, you've um, adverted this in your talk, and I think Jim talked about it, which is there's some companies who clearly thought through their business plan, philosophy, TW Telecom, and again, Larissa, sorry, she couldn't be here, that are for real, are sustainable. Others were phantom companies. They looked like they might be making a big impact, but when all said and done, there wasn't that much left. What distinguishing characteristics between those two, what are real sustaining competitors versus those that are more ephemeral, would you point to? Well, some of it starts with transparency. So uh, companies who are real businesses want to share what's really going on in their business in a way that 
their audience can understand it. The Warren Buffett reference, you know, if the business is not understandable, some of that's due to complexity. Some of those people don't want you to really understand their business because they've got something to hide. You know, and if you've got something to hide, you kind of make it opaque. So I think one of it is if they're willing to really share, share with you how the business works financially, there's probably more to it. Uh, I think a lot of it comes down to if you look at who the investors are and who the senior management team are, you should be able to tell from kind of relatively limited amount of conversations, is there a long-term conviction to really build a business based on the fundamentals of, of cash flow over time, or are they telling stories? Are they telling right. stories that are trying to build the hype of a business so that someone, some greater fool can come along, buy it out for a high price, and they hit the exit. But, I mean, you know, let me let me take a stab at it from a slightly less sort of nefarious sounding narrative, I suppose. That um, in the beginning, like Warren Buffett said, in the beginning you know, there were wise men, right? And and it was very clear that there was there were demand constraints throughout the market. And in retrospect, I think what happened was Wall Street did what it usually does, which is it said, okay, and let's the uh, in the primary capital raising function of Wall Street. So let's try to raise capital to create new companies in this business. Um, and that may have been a sensible thing to do. Lucent was doing what it does, which is, says, wait a second, we can actually advance dramatically what we can do through an entirely different approach than what Wall Street is doing. Instead of throwing more companies at it, we can take these steps from OC3 to OC12 to, to OC190. And, 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 that massive capacity increase was happening in a separate silo from the people who were funding the networks who looked at the problem as there's not enough networks. And the Silicon Valley version of the story was Sienna. Sienna was creating dense wave division multiplexing at the time in a completely different silo with a completely different mindset. Um, and the problem for what happened is that they all worked. Um, you had three simultaneous solutions to a problem, all of which worked and layered on top of each other, created a calamity um, because there was suddenly this vast excess capacity. Now, the secondary markets of Wall Street, that is, after the primary market function of creating new companies and, and capital raising, the secondary market function is, is the stock market, right? It, or what some would call the tertiary function, um, trading the value of companies. And that's really where it went haywire, and, and that's, that's where bubbles are created. Um, and capital is like water, right? It always flows to the easiest place first. That's why your basement fills up with water before your attic. And, and so the easy place in the, in the fiber business was connecting six points around the country and calling it a national um, backbone network. I think Dale said it right earlier in the first panel, which is, there were real capacity constraints in lots of places out of the in the in what you think of as the middle mile parts of the network, special access. But that's hard work, right? That took that takes a long time and a lot of heavy lifting. And the capital flows to the places that are easy. So if you knew that you could you, you could connect six points for $3 billion and get a $9 billion capitalization for doing it, of course you would do that, right? And you had lots of people that started to do that. That was the funny money um, function of all this. But it really started with, I think, a, a, a genuine um, problem, which was there was, there was insufficient capacity and you had three different approaches to try to solve it and they all worked. But so, wasn't part of the problem that those kinds of investors hit, that they were throwing a lot of money into a market where the parts of the network that they were not building out, the special access, the local loops, the how do you get to the ring from the 3.5 million commercial buildings in the country, that part of the market, based on the 96 Act and the FCC's descriptions of what it was doing, was supposed to be open to them on a regulated basis, thanks to interconnection and thanks to special access regulation. During this same time period, the Commission backed away from regulating special access and from policing interconnection and, and really uh, being rigorous about data collection and market assessment and imposing stiff interconnection obligations on the incumbents. I mean, a lot of the early fiber builds were connecting the harder to reach places at the time. MFS did that, TCG did that, Brooks did it, MFN, now then above net, 
That's what they were doing. That's what ICG was doing. So. I, you know, it was but that, but that was the, that was hard and slow. Those are hard, but those business. are the companies that end up surviving, right? Because it's hard and slow, and it was a real business. Yeah, but it, but it was after that that the phase of you know, years well, after that yeah. that the phase of connecting up handfuls of buildings and calling yourself a network and expecting a three for one turn on your capital just because you spent it on five. So yeah. um, the FCC didn't see. A difference. I think in general, Washington didn't see any distinguishing characteristics of any of that. So instead of at the you know, regulatory agencies are on their thinnest ice when they're making predictions about the future. They're better maybe at analyzing what the current situation is. They're, and the FCC is in the hardest position because it has to do so in this industry and with technology. So at the very moment when a regulatory agency should be at its most rigorous, unfortunately, most of the time, the regulatory agency licks its finger, sticks it in the air, and tries to see which way the wind is blowing and makes its decisions based on that. And so it, in a lot of ways in 99, this is what the FCC was doing. It didn't go through the really hard work of saying, OK, let, let's, let's rigorously analyze product markets and understand the difference, as you were saying, Phil, between one type of voice service and another. Um, are, we, are we talking about uh, competition for uh, uh, inner city backbone versus metropolitan area networks versus channel terminations at the last mile. Are we looking at things like DS1s and DS3s or are we looking at big OC level capacity um, circuits? The FCC didn't make those kind of distinguishing uh, analyses that they really needed to do. Uh, and, and, it's, and they also didn't do that on the geographic basis. They didn't say, okay, we're going to do the hard work of really breaking down geographic markets in a rational area. Um, and then once they do those two things, the next things the FCC has to do is look at what actual competition is at, the, at that moment and then do a rigorous job of looking at potential competition, right? So we, instead of saying, okay, we're just going to guess about what the future competition is going to be, why doesn't the FCC go and say, all right, let's look at the environment and see are there high barriers to entry and exit? Um, are there um, sunk costs? Uh, do the competitors have the same access to input and, uh, and to technology? Um, uh, and I think in the Phoenix decision, you started to see the FCC moving back towards that type of analysis, um, the kind of analysis that you knew from DOJ, instead of this uh, more um, uh, less rigorous uh, uh, kind of stick your finger in the air 1999 approach. So John, let me jump to you because one of the barriers to entry that people talk about now, and I think was really the question that was asked of, of Milo, and, and we'll come back to this, is what happened to the capital markets and to capital after this, you know, big bust? Uh, can companies post the bust get funding, or did investors go from being stupid to scared? Um, people <clears throat> went to put $250 million into a prayer versus a well-thought-out business plan by someone who's a real operator with a sustainable business can't get funded. So it's, I think that's the crux of where we were in 2004. So just the points on that story, all four of those investors put a, a, quarter, a quarter of a billion in, so a total of a billion dollars that was going in four months, done. And that, that meeting I was at, just an example of the evaporation of wealth that happened as quickly as it did. So using that as a backdrop, you had very large, probably the, some of the best known investment firms in the private capital markets, um, go you know Teddy Forsman, who was a who was a legend, you know basically was kind of you know neck and neck with you know the the KKR guys. He made three bets in telecom and he was done. Entire firm shut down and they went they went out of business. So there was you know the amount of the amount of of value that was destroyed was pretty. You know, to say that it caused that the housing crisis, I think that there's certainly a linkage there. I also think there was enough hype built around the internet stuff that it was kind of a, a compounding effect that led to Greenspan trying to reinflate it. But I would agree, I would agree to a certain degree with your point. I think what what you saw in 2004 were you know three two three firms that were I would say had more of a private equity orientation. Um, Columbia was one, and I think you look at the investment with, with Dan here at ICG as one of the, you, know, you were absolutely a pilgrim in the wilderness. I mean, when you, when you actually, when I went to talk to people who gave me money, 
about doing telecom investing. I remember we had an annual meeting. We had an investor look at me and goes, that's the last fund you're ever raising, and like walk out of the conversation. So we were getting pretty icy receptions at that point. Um, we made 20 times our money on ICG. So what did that investor say to you later? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, he wasn't it. Yeah, no, she, yeah. <laughs> she, she said thanks, and um, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing for me next time? Exactly, that's Andy Caruso. So, um, but they were, they were, I'd, I'd say there was, there was a group of, I'd say three or four firms that were absolute you know, pilgrims in the wilderness, and then there were the distressed debt guys that came in there. And what happened was a healing of the markets in which a lot of that excess capacity, a lot of the bad business plans effectively got extinguished. And what has happened over a period of time is people have gravitated towards very strong operating businesses. You've been able to track them. The clarity, the, the point towards clarity and visibility in your business is 100% spot on. If you look at when we were starting Zayo, people thought, you know, we were crazy at that point. All the fiber's been bought up. You know, Dan's done 20 acquisitions. Um, Charles Myers will be speaking here later. You know, you think of Equinix was dead and left for gone, you know, in terms of the data center space. That company is probably, you know, we're, we're talking about fiber here. Equinix probably represents one of the two or three most critical pieces of communications infrastructure in the world, what they, what they control right now. I mean, there are some unbelievably valuable and powerful businesses that came out of the, out of the bust, but driven by great management teams, people that were hardened in it. And now, you know, any number of deals that we're in, we, we've stayed kind of true to the telecom infrastructure. We're getting calls from private equity guys now coming back into the space. It's 12 years later, but capital is now coming back in because you've got visibility, companies that have shown value creation. But I mean, Dan and I had a big tussle probably four years ago when he was out there talking about communicating to the investment market they need to have more visibility. And he's, you know, that visibility, I think, has given a huge amount of credibility into the space. The Equinix guys have done a great job with it as well. But it's taken a long, long time to get people back in. But the speculative builds of, you know, half a billion dollars and let's, let's have at it, those are still pretty darn tough to find. Dan? Show of hands. Who here has had tequila before? <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Another show of hands. Who here has drank too much tequila at some point in time? <laughs> okay, so after you drank too much tequila, when did you drink tequila again? Probably not for a long time. So think of the telecom boom as a big tequila party, <laughs> a real big one. Think of the meltdown as being a tequila hangover, and it lasts a long time. So a lot of the success we had was when fiber-based properties were being totally ignored, being treated as radioactive. Why in the world would you want to own a fiber-based property? Well, that's when a correction begins. That's like buying housing two years ago or three years ago after the big bust. If you were smart and bought the right type of housing then, you probably made a whole bunch of money. Well, we were buying up fiber-based properties while other people weren't paying attention because they were trying to recover from their tequila hangover. But I think, you know, all fair points, but I think the, the challenge for whether you fund edge networks, competitive edge networks, like Milo's or like Verizon Fios, is still um, an analytical exercise of can you earn a decent return at that, at, at that totally business. Great. And I, I think we certainly haven't seen anything like a bubble, but neither have we seen a, I just flat don't believe that it's a conceivable project. I think you've actually had pretty hard-headed analysis that said, okay, but you know, what, what do you have to believe to make this a, a decent return? And I, I think that, that actually Verizon, um, in starting Fios, uh, sold the market that the idea was going to be a much better investment than it turned out to be by a long shot. In, in retrospect, it's actually been a really poor return. Um, but I think the consensus was going in that it might actually be a good idea. It turned out um, to be a, a pretty poor one. In, importantly, he, Craig makes his observations even after the FCC eliminated the requirement that they share that investment with other competitive providers. That's right. So he's saying it's a bad investment after the FCC eliminated those regulations. And I believe part of Dan's strategy at Zayo, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, 
is that I believe that you've done quite a bit of wireless backhaul fiber work. You've connected a lot of, a lot of towers. So that kind of gets at the issue that Paul was suggesting that somehow things are amiss in the special access market because there's a competitive provider that came in and filled a, a need, the demand, because 3G and 4G networks needed higher capacity at those base stations. You know, one, uh, 1 1.5 DS1 was not going to do it. His firm came in, filled that need on a facilities basis and is competitive and is successful today. I think that the, the focus on requiring incumbent carriers to share their network, and that gets at the issue that you raised before, what does the FCC still treat as dominant? They treat facilities as dominant, not just services. So you have inter, interstate and exchange services, but they, they're treating facilities as being provided by dominant carriers. And if they required, what we did while we were there is we said if they're putting in new facilities, fiber-based you know, uh, systems, packet-based fiber, that they would get out from under regulation. So you can invest your way out of regulation. And that was in response to the depression that you're talking about. In 2002, we had every CEO from equipment manufacturers and all the telecom vendors come in and beg us to rationalize the FCC's unbundling system. And as a result of that, Verizon ended up you know, spending $25 billion on you know, fiber-based uh, investment to the residential market. So let me break out two special access issues and then get some questions from the audience. One is what we had been talking about earlier and what Colleen's referred to as the $3.5 million big business customers who need big pipes. The second is what you just mentioned and, and gave Dan a lot of credit for seeing the importance of, which is backhaul to wireless, particularly as wireless data is becoming bigger. Um, Paul, why don't you start as you handicap those two markets and see where competition plays a role in each. How do you, how do you think about them and analyze them? Well, I think first, again, it comes down to separating out product markets. And so it may be that for some wireless backhaul, for example, we're talking about essentially big pipes. We're not talking about DS1s and DS3s. We're talking about something much more. Um, uh, and it may be for some businesses, we're talking about much, much smaller pipes. There are a lot of businesses around the country that continue to rely on DS1s and DS3s for card swipes and ATM machines and all kinds of things where you don't have to have streaming video over your network and therefore you use a, a, different, uh, a different product. As far as I know, none of my banking clients plan on using their ATM networks for gaming. So we just don't need a lot of capacity. So I think the first thing you want to do is you want to break those down and say, OK, um, let's have the FCC understand whether if you have a, um, a, a big fat pipe versus um, a skinny pipe, there's a difference in the amount of competition. And maybe that's because uh, there are different returns. There are different customers. There are different barriers. Similarly, I think you have to do an analysis that breaks down the difference between channel terminations, that last mile, and the transport and the backhaul, uh, and the, um, uh, 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 the inner city uh, backbone. Because the ILEX have a, a really different situation in uh, the channel termination market where great advantages from historical ubiquity, access to conduit, access to buildings, these are real things that matter a lot to these companies that are trying to compete with them, as we heard um, uh, in, in the first uh, presentation from Jim. You know, that, that adds cost and means the barriers to entry are much, much higher. And so I guess in separating those two, I would make sure to do a really hard job, that really hard work in the beginning of making sure I separate out those things. Do you that, Kelly? Uh, the only thing I would add is I think the, the FCC's, you know, Tom mentioned the green field. Uh, the FCC did not have interconnection requirements when an incumbent company built out new fiber. The idea being, well, you know, they're on the same footing as anyone else to get a bell of fiber. There's nothing magic about fiber. You know, it takes trenching, conduit, truck rolls, employees, linemen, switches, rights of way. All of the high entry barrier costs of building a network are the same whether you're pulling copper or fiber. So to distinguish, I mean, that to me was a, a, a good example of the lack of sort of rigor in thinking through what are the costs and what are the sort of physical brute realities of building a network. The only other point I'd make is for a lot of enterprise customers, 
they buy nationwide networks. So it doesn't do them any good that Time Warner Telecom has fiber to a thousand buildings in Houston. If Time Warner Telecom can't come in and say, I can, give, I can meet all your nationwide needs for T1s, then they're in the mix, they're in the bid. We'll look at that response to the RFP. But in order for that to be the case, the, the TWTs and the, you know, all the, the, the level threes, the new entrants, they've got to be able to buy cap network capacity where they don't have the facilities themselves. Otherwise, they can't come in. And, you know, it's the, the problem of you don't spring forth fully formed as a network. So you, you've got to have a time frame where a competitor can buy capacity that it can't build and use that purchase capacity until it can build. That's a timeline. And I think a lot of times the street doesn't have patience. They aren't willing to give anybody the time that it takes to build up. So, so Dan, one theme that reverberated through the first panel and has continued here is how hard a business this is and how difficult it is to compete against the big guys successfully. You uh, maintain a, um, a strong sense of optimism. W what keeps you going and not getting too deterred by the challenges that some of the folks have been talking about? Uh, telecom is inherently complex between a lot of complicated regulation, a lot of technology change. The bandwidth is growing at 40, 50 percent a year. A lot of stuff has to happen behind the scenes to keep pace. So it is an inherently complex business. Uh, you know, the business model I'm part of is a pretty simple form of the business, but I've been in most of the areas. In fact, some of the businesses we run are still wholesale voice off to the side. That's still inherently complex. Uh, you know, we try to focus on, and you know, the Warren Buffett reference earlier about, you know, there is advantages to business models that are more straightforward because people can understand them better. So we try to keep our business model itself focused on the more straightforward aspects of of just producing bandwidth as a, as a you know, kind of commodity, a valuable commodity, but commodity nonetheless. How about the challenges I mentioned? Colleen mentioned you have to be nationwide, and Paul has mentioned that competing against incumbents who, if you're lucky, have a price umbrella. If you're unlucky, actually try to selectively undercut you um, wherever you're offering your services. How have you differentiated yourself and managed to evade those two challenges? Anyone from AT&T or Verizon in here? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to leave the room. I'm not scale, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I need you to leave the room for a second. So uh, AT&T and Verizon are our two largest customers. Uh, notwithstanding that, if I had to pick two companies to compete against, it might be AT&T and Verizon. You know, I, I like our chances against them. So this is, but I think you made a point, which I think is a fallacy. You just made a you made a statement as fact, which I think is fallacy, which is you've got to have a nationwide nationwide. I was repeating what Colleen said. Okay, sorry. So uh, I think I, I think I the know. customers the customers want you to have a nationwide network. Yes. So the customers want ubiquity, for to have yeah, sale, yeah. yeah to have a sustainable business model. You know what what we've seen time and time and again because I've invested you know I've lost plenty of money investing in nationwide networks. Where you make money is in more networks you've got den density, depth, and that, so you make that initial capital spend, and it's the incremental capital that you spend then reaching out inside that market. You're further building the barriers to entry. It's, you're lowering your cost to access new customers. When you start playing the flag planning game, you know, and AT&T can tell you they're trying to maintain CapEx across, you know, 300 markets. I mean, it is a flipping <coughs> nightmare. Especially when you get to the example of equipment start getting getting old, and the, you start running down that trap, and it's just a it's a slippery slope to a lot of brackets around returns. So, Craig, both Dan and John, in different ways, have given you the <clears throat> optimistic theory of the case, which would apply certainly to say Zao, Chiba Telecom, and, and probably Level Three as well. As an analyst, do you buy that case? Are those companies you think long-term sustainable, good bets, or sure. uh, you know, look, I mean. It, 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 it's a pretty good place to start when you've got demand increasing in any market 50% a year, yeah. right? I mean, as a, as a foundational premise, that's a great place to start. Um, but, but, you know, one of the reasons that it's a good business is partly because a lot of the assets that they've been able to accumulate, they accumulated at pennies on the dollar. Um, it, it's a very different proposition to say, would you go in and greenfield the business that they have today? 
Um, probably not. Um, you know, you can. There's people making money with iridium, right? Iridium was one of the worst investments ever made, but some at some price it turns into an acceptable business. And and so you know, being opportunistic and saying, here's a business that can sell into an attractive demand growth market. Sure. Look at questions from the audience first. Uh, any students have got a question? All right, uh, I won't call. I oh, do have one back there. Outstanding. Yes, Ryan. <clears throat> Enough that that won't happen, or as investors got smart enough that that won't happen again. John, can I start? I don't think enough money has been made in telecom uh, to get the tequila party started in in this part of the business right now. I think there is, you can see some elements, some of the business where you see you know low latency trading gets to be really hot, and potentially that funds kind of you've seen some business plans around that. Um, I think if if I was to to look at where the money is going right now, like easy money is going right now. It's more into the commodity space. It's the guys who are competing with, with Charles, but building a commodity data center space that don't really have the secret sauce of what those guys have. I think on the fiber side, there's been enough consolidation that you're, you're not seeing, I totally agree with you, like the greenfield premise of going in and saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna greenfield, I'm gonna go and build Tupelo, Mississippi because I'm going to build Tupelo, Mississippi. That probably doesn't happen. Unless but, you're Google in Kansas City, I well, guess. But, you know, <laughs> Google also has one of the greatest business models of all time, right? They're not, their business model is not dependent upon a successful fiber build in Kansas City. But for Dan to go build Tupelo, Mississippi, because he's got Verizon as an anchor customer that wants fiber to the tower, and, you know, there is a business case around that. But to go greenfield that without having, like, the greatest business model of all time, you know, is difficult at least at least right now i can see parts of the market where it's getting hot but not crazy hot not you know 29 guys in a room no one knows anything and everyone's lining up to try to write a quarter of a billion dollar check hot <laughs> all right other questions yeah back there what's it going to take in terms of the FCC regulation to get special access competitive. And why does it seem as though when the FCC does deregulate an MSA, rates go up? Why is it I don't have level three and SEO and other smaller providers in my, VIC, in my product mix I purchase for Visa? Um, one of the reasons is they don't have the products, the sales force, they don't have the robust network nationwide. Visa is basically a reflection of the population of the US. I need a ubiquitous pickup point. You know, the leverage is still there. I'm getting leveraged at the table when I go through a four-month negotiation with AT&T. What's the FCC going to do? Will they do anything? Paul, you've made the case that they overplayed their hand in 1999. John's question is, if that's so evident now, why aren't they acting? Or, and I'll get to Tom. Why maybe shouldn't they act if that's your view? Um, well, I, you know, I think they are acting. They're acting slowly, uh, deliberatively, um, but uh, they're they're moving forward. The FCC is uh, um, just taking a um, one step, which is to say that this decision in 1999 um, uh, setting this co-location proxy trigger has been put on hold um, while they do a data request. And so now we'll see. I guess we'll see what the data request looks like and whether they um, uh, and what they find uh, as they move forward. Um, it's been uh, a long time uh, that the SEC hasn't acted there. And I think, look, the, the data request may find that for some products in some areas um, that there is enough competition that, uh, uh, that we can have uh, pricing flexibility and that there's real competition in those places where there's been real real effort and that there are others for some products and some geographies where where they're not um, I think a lot of people believe that the latter is a lot bigger than the former but the FCC is just gonna have to roll up its sleeves and, and do the work Tom do you have a view on this 
Well, I think it's interesting that we're talking about how difficult the business is, this is, how capital intensive it is, but somehow it makes sense to folks that the FCC should determine how the incumbent carriers monetize that investment. I, mean, I would simply note that on the residential side where we simplified the regulation when I was at the FCC, there was quite extraordinary investment and there is competition you know, at, at quite a few levels on the residential side. Um, you know, on the enterprise side, there's still a morass of regulation, both special access, which uh, Paul is alluding to, as well as uni regulation. And I think that the FCC's determination in, was it Quest, Quest um, Phoenix? Yeah. The Quest Phoenix? I mean, if you read that decision, what, what the FCC said there was that until the applicant can demonstrate that the alternatives such as wireless and VoIP technology are, have a price, are having a price constraining effect, we don't think we should forbear from regulation. So that's the, the additional tweak that the FCC most recently put on getting you know, these carriers out from under regulation. I would just observe that that's CenturyTel now, that's Craig's company, and they're losing, or were, when they combined, one million lines a year between the two companies. That's how many access lines they were losing. But somehow, somehow they have to demonstrate to regulators that these other alternative technologies are having a price constraining effect. To me, that makes no sense. That's not the test we adopted, and I think that we were much closer to getting it right. Craig, John, do you have a view on special access and what the regulatory regime there, if at all, should look like? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually an issue that, that I hear almost nothing about on Wall Street. I think it's partly because there's so little disclosure of special access in the financials of the company. You, you can dig through Verizon and AT&T's financial statements and there's a line item for wholesale, but that's about all it says. And they're good luck trying to figure out what special access is as a business. So on Wall Street, it gets almost no attention. Um, you know, and I started to talk to investors about um, about look, you know, you got to understand that we're when you open an NPRM for special access, it, there's huge amounts of value at stake. You know, they look at you with glazed eyes and say, you know, who, who's going to get the iPhone five? <laughs> and 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 so it's it's just not an area that gets that gets any attention on Wall Street. Other questions. Yeah, Donna. So I have a follow-up on that. Donna, we'll, get you, we'll get you a mic, Donna. <coughs> a loud, booming voice. Donna Jagers from DA Davidson. Um, so a follow-up on the special access uh, NPRM that the FCC is looking at. It seems like one of the most uh, illegal things that the FCC is doing, or the, that the illegal things that the big companies are doing, <laughs> is that um, AT&T <laughs> AT and Verizon require a, a company to buy 85 to 100 percent of the same amount that they bought from them last year in order to get the best rates on special access. That's a nice cozy tying arrangement. Do you think the FCC is going to do anything about that? Because that alone would at least allow some of the other competitors to start profiting from special access and increase competition. So just to kind of again, um, this is a complicated picture um, apropos of the eyes glazing over. Special access, broad term, governs different contexts. At the minimum, these big business customers also use for the backhaul for wireless. There's a question about, is there lack of competition and prices are too high, so you need more of the triggers to regulate it? Second question, is competition hindered by, let's call it, any competitive agreements like the kind Donna described? Um, Dan, you nodding your head yes? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, that I agree with. Yes. Uh, Colleen? I, I, you know, I, I have to say enterprise customers may be a, a little late to the table on this is the um, terms and conditions side of anti-competitive behavior. We're sort of more into show me the money side. We would like to see the commission push prices down. But the, the other side of the special access equation is these terms and conditions that that impede the development of competition. And, and I, I think um, other people at the table are perhaps more interested in that because they're more affected by it. But the provision, the specific provision that you mentioned, 
caught the eye of enterprise customers, it's this is a provision that says my most deeply discounted prices are only available to somebody who promises to give me all their business. And that makes it really hard for a competitor to then get some of that business. Now, we're talking about a discount that goes to somebody who spends $10 and somebody who spends $100 as long as 100% of their business is going to that provider. So there's really kind of no cost justification whatsoever for the discount. The only purpose of this term and condition is to kind of lock up that that demand and keep it away from competitors. Not a big issue for enterprise customers because you know that was something that IXCs, those, those kinds of provisions, growth discounts and, and exclusivity commitments were a bigger part of the market in the early 90s and it's something that savvy enterprise customers negotiated away and said, all right, you're out of the mix. If, I, no, I'm not gonna give you a 90% exclusivity commitment. Go away, next person come in they had competitive alternatives. If you don't have competitive alternatives, you just, if you want to get the lowest rate, you've got to sign up for an anti-competitive provision. So now enterprise customers are starting to focus on that because to the extent that those kinds of provisions, those structural uh, characteristics impede the development of competition, then it impedes the kind of price reductions we want to see. So before I let Paul answer the actual question Don asked, which is, will the FCC do anything about that issue? It's worth noting, I think with Ann Bingham in here, um, antitrust authorities are not able to exercise oversight over this issue because of a Supreme Court decision, um, Trinco, which says where the FCC maintains regulatory oversight, uh, it's questionable about whether or not antitrust has a role. So uh, the pressure here is uniquely on the FCC, where otherwise you might say this sounds like an antitrust type issue. Paul, is the FCC likely to act uh, in this context, putting even aside the question about pricing regulation? Yeah, li likely to act in the FCC. I, I, it's, cr cr you know, crystal ball chasing for the FCC um, it is hard. It, um, you know, there are politics involved uh, on this, and so I can't say whether they will or won't uh, uh, act. What I can say is that I'm pretty sure that this is going to be at the core of the proceeding. Um, um, there are, I see there being three legs to the special access proceedings stool. So one is this. Um, triggers that we talked about, you know, what should the, the trigger be for where someplace is competitive enough and is not for one type of regulation or another. The second is in those places where it's not competitive enough, what do we do? Should there be, what should the price cap be and should we have productivity factor that takes care of things we're not? And then the third is what do we do about these terms and conditions? And there are a set of these terms that are in uh, the special access tariffs that, that some consider to be anti-competitive. You know, if if you even if you have somebody that goes in and makes an investment and, and does a great job and offers a lower price um, in one part of a, a, a geographic area, if somebody's got places in a bunch of those areas and has to have service everywhere, or if they've got an incumbent contract, well, does that mean that competition, uh, the barriers to entry are even higher? Um, and I think the FCC will take a hard look at those questions. I really can't predict whether they'll do something about it. Let, let me go, Craig and, and John, give you uh, the final word, but I want to actually add a gloss to what Paul said, which is, you know, I asked the question previously to Dan about sort of how to be effective, and, and John explained the nationwide um, reach is not necessarily a constraint, but when you're up against the big guys, and this came up in the first panel, that's not necessarily an easy position. I think Roger Noel made the case, but you're able to do things they don't do and I think Dan gave that. Um, can you be an effective competitor even without the sort of regulatory protection of the type that Don is asking about in, in, in the case of the special access practices? Craig, how, how big an issue is that? Um, well, if, if you can be soup to nuts facilities based, um, then yeah, you know, the hard part is, is as, as you know, we've said, it's, it's really hard to make the economic case for the full suite of facilities. So at some point, you're gonna to have to depend on the incumbent network, and you're gonna need regulatory um, relief to make sure you can get it. Um, so, so, you know, it, it, these, are, these are real issues. I mean, it's, it, unless you have a regulatory framework that allows you to, to piggyback in at least some parts of your, your business, you're not gonna be able to get the other parts to, to make money. I, I, I just wanted to make one follow-on comment, though. Um, you know, let's, let's put the other hat on for a second. 
Verizon's return on invested capital in its wireline business is is about 1.3 percent, with a seven and a half percent cost of capital. <laughs> um, um, AT and T's is is above the cost of capital, but just barely. Um, and decline. And decline. And and while it's tempting to say, look at these big bad monopolists, and let's take away their special access business. Um, just understand that you're squeezing a balloon, right? And if you squeeze one side of the balloon, you say, okay, they can't make excess profits here. Um, and they can't make excess profits here, but it's perfectly acceptable to leave them with all the places where they lose money. Well, guess what? You got a real problem, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, that's, and that's a political problem. I mean, if, if we're... But it's, 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 a, it's yeah, a real economic it's, it's problem. It's a real economic right? problem. Cry me a river. Say, Cry me a river yeah. on AT&T. I mean, yeah. like... <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, wait, before, before we get the critical... I, I think Craig's point is raises a very um, challenging public policy question. I'm going to let Paul respond to it, and then we'll have to go, which is, you could say, and, and Tom made this, Verizon has lost a ton of money on their fiber deployment. Let them make it up on special access, and let's call it a day. They lost money on residential. Make it up on business customers. Yeah, that's well, a great Wait, 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 just to be clear, the history of <laughs> telecommunications regulation in this country is, is to do exactly is basically yes. yeah. that type of policy. Yeah. Right. So right. it's not right. like a new idea. But it only yeah. works. <laughs> you can't say out of one side of your mouth, well, this market's competitive, and out of the other side of your mouth saying, we can have lots of cross subsidies. But let me say it even differently, right? I mean, there is still, there is a large fixed cost infrastructure. And you, it, it's nice to pretend that, well, this is residential and this is, um, enterprise and this is wireless and this is wireline. It's all one infrastructure. I mean, the vast majority of this is single infrastructure, and what we're talking about are cost allocation problems, right? Which is, well, let me allocate it to this or let me allocate it to that. I the disagree. I think it is there are geographic markets uh, in the classic antitrust sense, and where the FCC's regulation went off the rails is when they abandoned generally accepted economic principles for analyzing markets and went on this predictive thing and this well it's all one and gave up sort of rigor. So there are there are geographic markets. So for absolutely but there and there are also segments. The problem is trying to do both of them at the same time. Right, we're gonna we're gonna have yeah. to wind this up. We've teed up the final panel nicely. I want to thank you all for a great discussion. <laughs>